welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Chris Kirsten with the Sabre Institute. I do public outreach and this is our panel presentation on becoming a hub. We're going to do about a 40 minute panel where we talk with some really amazing individuals from our hub network and then open it up to a Q&A. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my amazing teammate, Abby, who is our network coordinator for the Savory Institute. She's got a little uh, slideshow that she's going to show us and, and introduce the panelists. So Abby, I'll pass it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. I am the Savory Global Network Coordinator, which means I get to work with the amazing hub leaders all over the world, like our panelists today. And then my husband and I are also hub leaders, and we have the hubs that serve Northern California and Nevada here in the United States. So sometimes I'll be answering questions from my coordinator role and then sometimes from my hub leader role. So before we go too much farther, I want to introduce the other panelists. I'll start with my husband, Spencer. Spencer, do you want to give a quick introduction? Hey, good morning, everybody. Super happy to be here with the rest of the hub panelists and, and the attendees on board. Lots of amazing stuff happen across the world with the Saver Institute from market opportunities to regenerating landscapes. So super excited to be a part of it and a part of this conversation. Thanks. Jorgen, would you like to go next in it with a quick introduction? Okay, so my name is Jorgen Anderson and I'm leading the hub, so-called Nordic hub, quite a few small countries north of Europe. And I'm happy to be a part of this amazing network that we are. Awesome, awesome. thank you, Jorgen. And Juan Pedro from Argentina. Yes, uh, hi everyone, I'm Juan Pedro. I'm working for Obis21. We are the hub here in Argentina trying to promote uh, holistic management in South America mostly. Uh, very happy to be here having a chat with you. Thank you for the invitation. Awesome, thank you. And Rolf, are you there? Hi everyone, it's uh, Rolf from South Africa. I'm here with Mikhail. We coordinate the work uh, for the Save Rehab in South Africa and we're also working with some of the smaller countries around South Africa, helping them. Nice to be here. Wonderful, welcome Rolf and his family team. And Mata, are you able to hear us now? Yes, I can hear you. I'm really happy to be a part of this global network too. So hi, hi everyone. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Glad to be yeah. here. Right. All right. So I just had a quick presentation to share. We went through our hosts. Um, I also want to recognize David Daly with the Savory Institute, who's providing our support and guidance today with the platform. And we discussed our panelists just to review. Wolf and Mikel are from South Africa. Spencer and I are from the United States. Juan Pedro from Argentina, Jorgen and Mata from Sweden, and hopefully we'll be, we'll, we will be joined later by our friend Lipa from Kenya. So just to get started on this conversation, the point of the panel and the discussion today is to talk about what is the Savory Hub and how to become one. And I think it's important to start though with the why. Why, why do we even have Savory Hubs in the first place? And it relates to the mission of the, of the Savory Institute and our, our purpose for even having this organization, and that is to regenerate the world's grasslands through the training of thousands of farmers and ranchers in holistic management. So we really believe in the pastoralists, the, the people on the ground to make the change that we need to see in the world, to take our species really in a new direction and stop the desertification of our planet. So there's a lot of different ways that we could go about reversing desertification and working with people around the world to do this work. There's different models of you know, big organizations, big nonprofits coming into different parts of the world and really pushing a message or pushing a project, infusing resources into the area. But the problem that we've seen and we observed is that when those resources are removed or that infrastructure has to pull out to go on to another place, then everything really implodes or it collapses and it doesn't create sustainable and regenerative results on the land. And so the vision of the Savory Institute is to create the Savory Global Network, which is a decentralized approach to this instead of a top-down push approach. We work with leaders and entrepreneurs around the world who want to create these outcomes in their part of the world. And then we connect and we provide resources to each other um, ideas, support, and we operate that way. So a hub is really key to the strategy of the Savory Institute and our work to reverse the desertification across the globe. 
So each hub leader operates their hub within their context in the world. So they teach holistic management and regenerative agriculture practices, but they do it within their context, meaning their cultural context, their geographic context, so it makes sense and, and can be applicable. So we really depend on the local leadership of the hub leaders to restore the grasslands in their part of the world. And we really feel a sense of urgency, and that's why the Savior Institute was formed, is that the time to expand holistic management to global consciousness is now. We really don't feel that we have a lot of time to experiment with other models, but we have to get results to take our planet and humanity in a new direction. So the work of the hubs is really, really critical to that. So within our hub network, we noticed that there was two different types of hubs emerging. And so we decided to formalize that and, and try to be more intentional about creating those types of hubs based on what we had noticed self-organizing and emerging from the network. So the two points of distinction within the hub network is an influencer hub and a business hub. And so the difference is that their hub really focuses more on an emergent model. So they are self-organizing, they're self-reporting, they focus more on their farm or their demonstration site and really showing and, and being an example and a gold standard of holistic management in their region. So we provide the suite of brands to them. They have the network access to the network, the collaboration platform that we offer our network where everyone can get together and share resources and communicate. And again, they, they self-report. So they're more about influencing in their region and showing being a great example of holistic management. And what we noticed is what we call um, a business or, or now we're calling a training hub is really a hub that is very much in the business of training and consulting in holistic management. And they're very much driving in business and pushing training in, in their region. And so we have both types of hubs on the call with us today, which I think would be really fascinating to get their different perspective and see how it all fits together. And so they are the influencer hub, again, self-reports and, and really manages their own work. And then the training hub is in a high performance, high support partnership type relationship with the Save Institute, where there's investments and grants and partnerships that we co-collaborate on creating to drive this mission in a certain region of the world. So that's just to provide some context and overview. That's what I wanted to share with you so that it, it made a little bit more sense of why we have a network in the first place and what these different types of hubs that are emerging in the network. So Chris, I can turn it back over to you now to continue with our panel discussion. Great, thank you, Abby, that was awesome. So yeah, just a quick follow-up with you, Abby. What is a Savory Hub working to accomplish? What is their reason for existence? The point of a Savory Hub is to support the adoption of holistic management in a region and management of regenerative agriculture. The way that we believe we can reverse desertification across our globe is by working with the ones who are actually managing the animals and um, moving them across the land and empowering those people and enabling them and equipping them with the tools and the processes that they need to create regenerative outcomes in the land. And, and we know that holistic management is the framework to do that. And that's what we believe. That's you know what the network believes. And so a hub is that central training and education learning center that drives and supports that advancement of holistic management in the region. Awesome. Great job framing up that global vision for what the hubs are working to accomplish in their individual regions. And now I'm going to turn the question to Spencer. What does a hub actually do? How does that happen on a day-to-day -day basis to operationalize that big vision that Abby just framed out there? That's a great question. I think the answer to that is a little different for everybody. Most of us in the hub network, I think, are all ranchers or farmers to begin with. So the, the hub business for us kind of really lays right in with that. We accept folks to come onto the ranch with us and kind of learn and, and see what we're doing. And then also kind of in the off season, um, in the winter time when, when work's a lot slower because typically we're under snow, I travel a lot and offer holistic management trainings across California, Nevada, and various other parts of the West as well to kind of help farmers get up and going with holistic management. But like I say, I think that changes as far as where you are in the world. You know, the work that Juan Pedro does is probably similar in the big picture, but the nuances of how he 
accomplishes the the things that are happening with Ovis down there, unique to that space. Sure, sure. So, so the hubs are working to do training and implementation support. Many are focused on working with with researchers. Uh, many are working on policy support and working with their local, regional, and state governments. A number of them are doing work on entrepreneurial incubation and creating new opportunities for their region. Lots of hubs have opened new abattoirs. There's a number of hubs now talking about opening tanneries for leather goods. Many are involved in all sorts of, of various different processing and logistics. It's either part of their hub or side businesses supported by the hubs. So uh, so thank you for that, Spencer. I now want to open it up to the group and just kind of let everybody chime in with what makes sense for them and, and for their hub. But how do you guys contextualize this hub plan being a hub and being the ambassadors for holistic management and planned grazing in your region? I'd love to hear from some of you guys because I know you're coming from very different places. We've got folks from Africa and Europe and South America. It would be really cool to hear how you guys are operationalizing that to your context uh, in your specific area. All right, let's start with, with Jorgen. Why don't you tell us a little bit about operationalizing this in, in the Nordic countries? You and Meta are based there in Sweden. Yes, I would say that in our context, the knowledge about regenerative agriculture as we are trying to perform it is very low. So a big part of what we are doing is simply building awareness of, of the topic as such. So we are doing a lot of work on Facebook and one of the most important things that we do is that we are building this network and we call this a Nordic network for regenerative agriculture. And the role of the hub is to become a facilitator, a service the service function to this network of people who are looking at themselves as practitioners in regenerative agriculture. So the thing that has been going on for the past couple of years is that these people are finding each other. And as a hub, they're trying to make people find each other, to travel to each other, and, to, and we have all sorts of meetings. And, and simply building our little uh, family, our little community of nerds finding pleasure in trying to perform regenerative agriculture. And then as we continue, now I'm talking from the point of being the influencer hub. So facilitating a network like this, instead of concentrating on selling courses and trainings, we are, are more trying to facilitate the people who are asking for more knowledge, wherever they might be in, in their journey. So then we are trying to build a self-organized demand for this kind of knowledge that we are able to provide. So that's sort of another approach to the same target, to get all that land regenerated as fast as possible. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, Juan Pedro, how about how about yourself? I know you guys really focus to contrast what Jorgen's talking about. You guys focus really heavy on the training and really have been the torchbearers in the whole continent of South America for a long time. Tell us what it's like to be a hub for you guys down in Argentina. Uh, nowadays, uh, we are working mostly as a school as a regeneration school, we call it. And we have been trying to influence people nearby, Spanish uh, talking people. And we started with some courses in Patagonia. And then we went to Buenos Aires, which is the capital of Argentina. And people start coming from foreign countries. And we try to give them the seed. So they go back to other country and start organizing people and start organizing hubs and what we do is like try to open the gate and try to empower people and encourage them to start developing holistic management in their own countries uh, we did that in uruguay chile bolivia and spain and paraguay also and so we are very proud what is happening how the people is uh, responding to this we look forward to multiplicate this in all the region. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, for those not aware, Obis 21, the hub in Argentina, has trained thousands and thousands of practitioners throughout South America and has built a really cool, amazing network of wool producers. So they're a, a fantastic component of the network. So thank you, Juan Pedro. And then Mikhail and Rolf, why don't you guys share a little bit and, and maybe talk a little bit about communal work that you guys do, which is an entirely different aspect than the other two hubs that we heard from. Thanks, Chris. I think to start off with, just for those who are thinking of being a hub, we take very seriously the work that the Savory Institute does, and we make sure that 
first of all, that the training we give is exactly the way that it should be presented. I think the temptation sometimes is to try and find a better way or a quicker way. But I think from our perspective, it's very important that we stay true to the teaching that the Savory Institute gives. I think that's sort of our starting point. From a hub, specifically in South Africa, we have one foot in the first world and one foot in the third world very interesting environment to work in and I think the way that the hub network has been set up and the fact that we as a hub can change our context as we need to has really made it possible for us to work in a fairly complex environment. As some of you may have seen on the news, the commercial side of our operations are undergoing some challenging times, but our main focus currently is on development work which is in our communal areas. And really what we're doing there is we're doing a lot of community mobilization, we're getting 300 households to work together on three and a half thousand hectares and plan their grazing where they each own three or four or ten animals. So I guess a lot of our work is mobilization and the outcome of that is that we get them to work together to regenerate their land and the outcome for us is environmental. So yeah, so to recap, Sabre Institute, we provide the tools, everything, the curriculum, all the programming, everything that the hub needs to be successful in their region and then the hub goes and deploys that and then makes it contextualized to their area. So that's the how of, of how it works. And we got some great flavor from these individual locations. But, but Jorgen, I'm curious from you, kind of more of a philosophical and kind of visceral answer of why did you start a hub? Why were you inspired to do this in the first place? I mean, I think we all can recognize it's a big undertaking. What drove you to say, this is what I want to be part of my legacy? I would say that I would describe myself as uh, one of many people scattered all around the planet working in this direction. Uh, maybe not always being able to describe what we are really trying to achieve. We know that we are not happy with what's going on, but what do we want instead? So the, when I first encountered with the holistic management, and it was very much of a coming home feeling. Here is that language that is expressing the things that I've been sort of thinking about for a long time. And I think that goes for many of us, that this makes sense in a way that provides us with better tools to keep going on the same path that we already have been going in our different ways of doing it. So I would describe holistic management very much like a language. It's just a way of describing important things and, and how to do things. And the next thing is that you, you are not, no longer alone. Suddenly you can find yourself in a room with hundreds of similar nerds like yourself. That wasn't possible before I could meet with the Saver Institute. So that has meant a lot. And then you sort of get all this new inspiration and then you find you are adopting your way of doing things into this meeting with this whole concept on this new network of people. And Suddenly, you can really see how you're a part of something bigger than yourself and doing something in the same direction. That's a big part of the why. That was great. Yeah. I, I know you and I have talked about this before, but, you know, as, as I was ranching and farming, and I feel like I've been on this regenerative agriculture movement since about 2002, 2003. So about 15 years at this point. And for most of that time, I felt like I was on an island, like it was all by myself. Like I was the only one in my community that was doing all this quote unquote weird stuff and you know not not following the conventional norms and not using prescribed methodologies and best management practices and whatever all the neighbors were doing on what days they sprayed which chemicals and how they moved their cows around you know in and out of the mountains and down into the valley and when i found savory institute i joined the team 5 years ago i love the way that you use that phrase that coming home because it felt like joining this bigger family and it was like i'm not alone i'm not an island this isn't an isolated thing. This is a global movement that's taking place on every habitable continent around the globe, but it just may not be taking place in our backyard. And so to be connected to this bigger sphere of influence was really galvanizing for me. So thank you. I think many in the network share that same experience that you just described. So super cool. And I'm curious how your work day being involved with the hub compares with other young professional people your age in the country. Uh, does it look the same or similar or does it, does it look rather different? 
For me, the day-to-day business that I do is that I run an operation where I have about 40 farms that we source grass-fed beef from. So that's my main objective and that's my main day-to-day business, what I do. But I work with Jürgen. I really like the the term of influencer hub because that's really what we're doing. We're just trying to get the message out there and trying to get farmers interested in holistic management and in regenerating the land, basically. So so that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to reshape my business model. I, I took over this company from my dad who started it 17 years ago and that was just about grass-fed beef but he had a great vision but then holistic management didn't exist in our minds we didn't know about it i think it's almost like a key of knowing that yeah uh, cattle can be really good for our environment but we didn't really know how good until we found these methods that we could use so now we're just basically trying to incorporate it and also share the the message and the stories and get more people excited about doing it and creating a larger network in, in the Nordic region. And then, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to incorporating the land to market program also into the business model. So we're going to get it a more of a, a database, like hard facts, uh, not just the, the soft network of it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that point that you made about, you know, livestock is, is a tool that can be used for good. Every ecosystem on the planet has animals and plants working together for good. Why would we not want our farming and ranching systems to mimic that? The problem is, is that we have far too many examples of animals being used incorrectly. And I always use the example of like a livestock or a tool, and that tool can be used to uh, make things better or make things worse. And so the same way with a hammer, you can build a house, you can also tear a house down. And unfortunately, consumers today are getting far too many examples of the tear the house down type of examples. And we want to show them that there are many examples where we can go back to mimicking nature and use livestock to heal landscapes. And in fact, they're really our only solution to reverse climate change and bring carbon back into the soil through properly managed grasslands. So super cool. I'm glad you brought that point up. And then, Mikal, I want to ask you the same question. Of, of how your workday compares with, with other young professionals in South Africa? I spend a lot of my day outside in the field, learning about the grasses. I'm really trying to figure out how our environment works and how by looking at our land, we can really understand what it's telling us because it's amazing the stories that it's telling us. So yeah, that's basically my role at the moment. Excellent. Is that what uh, young people in Hogsback are also doing? Or are other people in your area doing the same thing? Um, no, they're not. I'm kind of a lone wolf at this stage, so not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, most of the people my age um, are actually studying, trying to still figure out what they want to do. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and Rolf, I'll turn it over to you while you guys have your mic open. What's the most fulfilling part of your work as being a, a hub leader? What kind of fills you with the most amount of passion and reward for the work that you're doing? That's a fairly simple one. You know, I think at heart, I do development. That's what we do. So I think, you know, just seeing how people take uh, what we teach them and make a difference to the land. But then when they come back to you and tell you that things like for the first time, they're able to send their kids to school without having to borrow money. I think that really has an impression on me. So I guess it's just being able to see the direct effect on people's lives once they've started implementing the holistic management program and uh, they're starting to earn a, you know, a little bit more income. Sure. Can you maybe follow up on that and give an example of somebody that's really you know, lifted themselves up by implementing the holistic management framework in their region and in their setting? Uh, Okay. Yeah. Look, I think it might be a a long discussion if I'm going too specifically, but I think we've just been, just to give everyone an example, we've been through, I think we're in our fourth year of drought and hopefully it's just broken. And in this period, the the rural farmers that are very poor that we work with lost about 50% of their wool sheep due to the drought. And the ones that we worked with, because they'd implemented the grazing and their sheep were able to have food over winter, managed to double their income, despite the fact that they lost half of their numbers. So I think that's just in concept of what happens. And I think specifically, you know, we've got that video on YouTube called A Yonder Story. People can go and have a look at it. They can perhaps just, uh, I think it's on, on the Savory website as well, just if they'd like to see something more specific. Yeah, really powerful. Spencer, now over to you. What's it like being part of the Savory network? So... You know, being a guy that, and for people that don't know Spencer, Spencer has run a number of really large 
uh, cattle operations here in, in the Great Basin region of, of California and Nevada. Very deserty country for people that don't know what I sometimes call flyover California, the, the forgotten part of California that is, that is extremely rural, fairly impoverished. It's just entirely different than what you see with the stereotypes of, of LA and San Francisco and the Bay Area. But what's it like for you having been somebody who's been very involved in the cattle industry for your, your career to now join a global network of people that are doing similar things, but in very different contexts around the, the world? What has that meant for you? Yeah, so it's been a fantastic resource for me because uh, working with the network, I've had the opportunity to meet all these folks that are on the call with us today and learn from all of them because we're all dealing with similar problems in different ways. And so here this last year or two, I've worked a lot with Pablo Borelli, who's been a big part of developing the, the EOV and the land and market program. And opportunity to work with a vast number of highly intelligent folks from around the world really broadened my understanding about how landscapes function and then how we can implement our tools to really maximize production and profit for the community that you're talking about, the um, rural and poor, or, and take those products to the rich and lucrative parts of the world and garner a little bit of that income for ourselves. So it has been a, a great learning experience. And Spencer, tell us, I mean, for, okay, so let me back up a little. For folks that don't know, we do a hub gathering every year typically, and we try to switch different sides of the globe where we host that gathering. And so Spencer, you've been on a number of these as well as to the hub boot camp, uh, which takes place in Zimbabwe, or there's an option to do in Zimbabwe. Tell us about your experience of kind of first traveling outside of, of California, specifically from a holistic management point of view, and meeting the other people in the network as you got on board and learned about holistic management and how to implement it. Yeah, that's a good question. You might have to keep me on track because there's a lot there. First of all, I hadn't really ever traveled anywhere before, period. So like I say, my world was pretty small before the opportunity to work with Dave Rand Student, travel to Africa and see all the good things that uh, Africa Center um, is doing in Zimbabwe. Again, taught me a lot. And then it also, I don't know, I think it connected me to, I don't know, maybe Jorgen said it best, was uh, talking about coming home and uh, finding this new family of folks that had similar shared values and were trying to create a better agricultural system for their communities and, and their local economies. It really brought to me the understanding that as vast as this network is all around the world, all of our communities are suffering from a lot of the same issues, be it lack of jobs in agricultural parts of the world, young folks having to move off the land because there's no longer enough of an economic incentive to stay with it and kind of maintain and keep on to the, the land base schools and hospitals and resources are just being drained from the parts of the world that grow our food and fiber. So, so that's not a problem specifically to the Western United States. I think that's an issue that all of us are probably seeing around the world. So like I say, meeting everybody has showed me a lot. I can't express how much I've learned from traveling with the network enough. It's been, been huge. Yeah, I, I share that experience and, you know, had traveled a little bit, but not extensively before joining the Savory Institute. And it, it's, you know, for most of my career, I had my head down and focused on my own ranch and, and doing my own thing. And it's been really eye opening to see how much similarity there is, even though the context is different, to see that, you know, the issues are the same everywhere. It's, you know, market price and these rural regions being extracted from its government policies that don't really understand the, the rancher and the farmer's position and, and what their life looks like. Uh, you know, it's weather instability and, and, and now climate challenges that we have to face on a daily basis. These are ubiquitous everywhere. And so it's been really great for me to be able to join a group that is galvanized in facing these same issues together, but then committed to help overcome them uh, in a way that's really constructive. And so that's been a really cool part for me to be a part of this, this group and this network, which I think is really similar to what you're saying. I'd love to talk a little bit more and, and dive a little deeper on this of how the hubs work together. So uh, I wanna start with Jorgen, because Jorgen, I know that you had a strong influence in getting the Turkey Hub started. And then I'd love to go to, to Juan Pedro. I know you mentioned working around uh, not only South America, but also with the Spain Hub. So I'm hoping that you can give us an example of 
of working with another hub as well. And I know these are just small examples. There are, are many network connections and nodes within the network that, that work together and sharpen each other all the time. But let's start with Jorgen. I know you have a special relationship with the Turkey Hub. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I have. So this was uh, sort of happening as I was first encountering with Sabre Institute. And then the stuff we've been doing here has been attracting people, study visits and such. And one day there was an exchange student from the University of Agriculture jumping off a bus at this place. And he stayed here for eight months. And we had a lot to learn uh, from each other during that period of time. And, and the whole thing ended up uh, him starting up the, the hub in Turkey as I was sort of starting it up here in, in, in Nordic countries. So there was huge benefit. And you can, as you said, Chris, there was huge difference in context between Anatolia and, and, and Scandinavia, but still we had so much to bring to each other and we still do. Almost every month or so we will have a, a chat of things, of life and, and, and hub stuff, and it's constantly feeding both of us. And not only now the Scandinavia and Turkey, and right now we have this people from Kenya being here with us in Sweden. So it just grows this thing of exchange between people and the way we are trying to figure out better what we're actually doing and how we can be better at achieving what we want to achieve while having a great time together. It's just such a nice thing to be able to sort of tap into each other like that. That's awesome. Yeah, so Durkin, so you were just getting started as a hub and, and Durkin, the hub leader in, in Turkey, in Anatolia, came and, and visited you and as you were kind of explaining what you were doing, he got super inspired, went back and he and his cousin Vulcan started the hub there in eastern Turkey, so east of Istanbul, and started the hub there working with the ranchers and farmers in their region. And then you guys have done a number of initiatives together of collaborative projects. One, as I recall, is specifically about getting urban folks involved and educated on ranching and farming issues. Is that something that you want to say anything about? Yeah, that's still going on. That's sort of uh, developing to new levels all the time. And that is regarding the topic of, or sometimes I usually say that the future farmers may not sort of come from the present ones. We have a lot of young people who do not yet know that they really are going to become excellent farmers. So we have to sort of catch them somehow and, and make that work. And Durukan was doing a lot of thinking and working on that and is doing that continuously. So actually it's challenging the idea of universities as such that people could go to another place and educate themselves to something very valuable and something that they can actually build a future on without having to go to those sort of uh, old time institutions. Mm -hmm. This is something that we can do much more together, hands on, learning by doing. And especially if you can do that while exchanging between different places on this planet. Uh, you can learn how to do chickens in Turkey and then you can continue to do the cows in England or whatever. You would always sort of learn. When you're dealing with young people, young people just want to sort of hang out with each other a lot as well. So it's so many uh, benefits from um, trying to organize exchange and learning among young people while traveling to each other and doing work. I mean, I, I really, learning by doing is really hands on and that's the most effective way you can learn something. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Juan Pedro, so coming back to you, give us some examples of where the Ovis Hub has worked with other strong centers of holistic management throughout Central and South America, and then you also mentioned working with the Spain Hub. Yes, Chris. Our experience, at least mine, is mostly with new hubs starting, that they are filling the forms with the Saber Institute to start being a hub, so we try to give them advice and help them and encourage them to start. That happened with Alehav, that's the hub in Spain. My father went there, he gave a complete course of uh, practitioners, and that group started the hub, uh, the Alehav, and we were so proud when they wrote the manifesto and started as a hub, so we now watch them in the news and we feel really good. Then. Chile is, is starting right now, maybe two months ago, I think. And what we first want to do with Chile is to train the first group uh, who will start to develop holistic management. So our advice mostly is try to train 15 or 20 people and they are going to lead and try to have some producers and some technicians so you can have your learning sites there. And you can also have your multipliers. And that is happening also in Uruguay right now. 
and we are mostly trying to help and to cooperate and to be there for them and to travel as much time as they need. We had a practitioner course uh, last year in Uruguay. So this year, we think they are ready to start with their assistance program. So we are trying to encourage them to, to find uh, some farms where we can start doing holistic management so we can keep on traveling and once they are already with the course done and they are working with their first farms uh, we think the job is done so we will keep on uh, communicating but i think our role right now is to multiplicate in in other countries we are trying to start right now in colombia also and it's a slow process but uh, we think it's going good Fantastic to hear. Thank, thank you for sharing that. It's so cool. I mean, you just rattle off all these countries like, oh, and we're starting here and there. <laughs> it's just amazing what you guys have done to, to plant seeds in the Spanish speaking parts of the world. So thank you guys for that. Super cool. Mikhail, how has uh, being part of the network changed your life? How would you explain that process to somebody that asked, you know, what it's like to be a part of all this? I would say it really inspires you to go out and really take the message across that there is another way to farm. There's another way to do things. And there's a way that we can actually take the desertified land all around the world and make it better and allow it to produce more so that we have healthier animals and we have a healthier life. Absolutely. Spencer, what advice do you have for people listening right now to this call? What advice would you give them in saying, hey, I'm, I'm interested in joining the network. Do you think it's a good thing for me? How would you approach that with somebody who asked you that question? Yeah, joining the network has definitely been a good thing for us. It all depends on context, right? So what are your desired outcomes? And, you know, what are your expectations? Becoming part of the network and becoming in ambassador, I guess, for lack of a better word, to holistic management is a fantastic opportunity, but, you know, it comes with a lot of work. It will keep you busy in terms of training and speaking and uh, meeting folks and, and really bringing this information, this knowledge to folks in your community. So long as folks come into it with the expectation that it's a full-time go and deal, I think there's always room for more folks. Everybody that joins the network has a unique skill set and opportunity to bring something to the network. So the more folks that we get signed up, the stronger we become. And I think that's the unique and wonderful part about the Savory Hub Network is that uh, we're getting some really fantastic and super knowledgeable folks that can help us. And that's one of the best things for me is when I come up to an issue, I can just reach out to somebody else in the network and ask for a creative solution that they may have or have seen. And the knowledge base that you get access to is phenomenal. Yeah. Can I add something? This is Abby as the, as the hub leader now, not the network coordinator. Absolutely. I just thinking back to when Spencer and I made the decision to join the hub and join the network, a big part of that reason was that it would be a real accelerator for us. So instead of us having to come up with our own curriculum and our own programming and all of those things, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We could connect to literally the best holistic management curriculum that there is and then offer that to our region. So we think of it as like this infusion of positivity and new ideas and innovation that we're facilitating uh, between the network and our local community. And it's really great to see that really come to life going into our fourth year actually as a hub. So being able to bring Will Harris out here to our convention and introduce them to our neighbors and see the excitement and people don't have access to that here. They, it's hard to find the resources to get away and, and access those types of ideas and innovation. So it's been great to be that facilitator of that energy into our region. And again, not have to reinvent the wheel, but be able to do that and create results in three or four years because we just don't have the time to reinvent things. We need to move faster than that. I really like where this question is going of, you know, what would you say to somebody that asked you as the hub leader or participant in the network about becoming a hub themselves? And so, Rolf, my next question is for you in terms of what's the most challenging part of being a hub? You know, we've talked about all the sunshine and roses part, but tell us from your perspective, what are the, what are the hard parts about being a hub leader and running a hub on a day-to-day -day basis? 
I think the you know hub is no different to any new business that's uh, starting, and I think often people will try and kind of bolt it on to something that they're already doing, and uh, you know just in my experience that really doesn't work that well or didn't work that well for us initially. So I, I think one of the challenges is that it, it does take time. You know, like any business, it's a three to five year process. You've got to make sure that you have the resources to be able to carry you through those sort of leaner times that were the same way you would uh, if you started any business. So I think for anybody going into this, and I'm talking now from a business hub perspective, is they need to count the cost on that sort of portion and plan more over a three to five year period rather than think they can jump into this thing and everything's going to start working. I think in that regard, possibly coming back to your last question, I think my advice to people that are interested and are not quite sure would be to go and sort of join up with a hub that's already possibly close by and see what it's like and see how they can work together and then make that move more gradually. I think that will also counter some of the, the initial challenges that we faced as one of the first hubs coming into the network. Yeah, that's great advice. So this, we're coming down to our close here. You know, we've talked about big issues facing society and civilization, humanity as a whole in a global perspective, things like climate change, poverty and desertification, food, and water insecurity. Jorgen, I'd love to hear from you first, and then I'm, I want to open it up to the group, but how do hubs feel like they're tackling this? Do you feel like you're part of making a dent in that on a global scale and, and really bringing team humanity to its next paradigm, to its next level, its next evolution? Oh yeah, certainly do. I think this species that we are, this homo sapiens, when there is a problem and people are unable to see any solution to a problem, the tendency is that we do not even see the problem. It's like the problem disappears until there is some kind of solution visible. So simply by providing a glimpse of, of a solution to such big problems, makes people see the problems themselves. So you don't really have to do much to make that kind of a dent. It's about hope, really. We are bringing hope, uh, but that's that's what it is. So it's suddenly, it's sort of possible to deal with some really big challenges and problems because it's actually possible to do the right thing and the right things will be done because it's viable and makes sense to, to people. And so that is very inspiring. And with all already said, the power of the network in combination with this actually being able to do something about big problems, it's, it's just a beautiful combination. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to riff off that a little bit and run through our, our list of panelists here for closing thoughts. But, you know, we've got some big challenges in front of us. But what gives you hope for the future? Let's start with Juan Pedro. Wow, that's a, a hard question. I really think we are in a huge moment of transition. I can see a way of producing that it's running out and people is noticing this. In Argentina, it's incredible how uh, times are changing. Many people is looking for alternatives, but institutions are not helping very much in this. But you can see the, the wave coming. I can see it. And I think when people will start to see that things are much simpler than they imagine. So I have hope. Uh, I think it's a big chance uh, we have right now to get things done, to accelerate this process of change. And I really noticed that something is different. I've been in OV21 just for two years, and I can see the change. Uh, that's fantastic. And then Meta, what gives you hope for the future? Yeah, sure. I would say it's a short one. It's people, basically, because in many other businesses that, that I come in contact with, I don't see this kind of massive hope as I feel when I hang out with farmers who have this regenerative idea about, yeah, we can do so much and we can change so much. Yeah. And then Rolf, close us out. You know, we've got some big challenges in front of us, but what gives you hope for the future? Yeah, I think it is about the way people are responding. And I think, as we've always said, that we don't need to prove that holistic management works anymore. It really does. And when people implement it the way it should be or manage, start managing the way they should, it really makes such a difference in people's lives. And because we are coming from a poorer type of environment, that change is dramatic. When you're coming off a fairly low base, you double your income in the first year. That's hope enough for anybody. And that's hope for us, you know. Uh, well, this has been super fun. I want to thank all of our, our panelists for participating. I also want to thank Dave Daly and our team for 
running the behind the scenes and, and getting the platform all set up for GoTo to work and questions and everything else and, and running the slideshow. So thank you, Dave. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the whole point of this was to show what the network is all about, highlight some stories from that. And now if you're more informed with more information, we invite you to join us on this journey. You know, we're, we're really trying to do nothing short of changing the world. And we're trying to do this on scale with a lot of flexibility. You heard a lot about context, take a really entrepreneurial approach, but this is really emerging as the network for regenerative agriculture. And if that's something that you want to be a part of, we should definitely continue that conversation. I think it's really clear that we have an amazing quote unquote family of people that are not only healing their landscapes, but also healing their communities. And I just think there's endless stories we could tell and we could dive in with each of our panelists and hub leaders not on the call about what they're doing in their region to rehab their communities and bring back these rural communities, which in most of the world have been forgotten as we become a more urban civilization. People are forgetting about their rural roots and the landscapes that support those urban centers. And so there's just some really incredible stuff going on as this network. And I'm just really proud to be a part of it through the Sabre Institute. If that's something y'all wanna be a part of, would love to have you apply. There's a number of other roles in addition to being a hub leader that you can explore. And so we've got a form that you can fill out and you can go on the website and fill out that form. And then if you already filled out the form, just make sure and, and keep being in touch with Abby. Uh, she's the point of contact for that to kind of keep having that conversation, explore what it would look like for you as an individual to, to join the network. Hubs do it a lot of different ways. For our hub, personally, we did a crowdfunding campaign. Spencer and I started with absolutely nothing. We had no demonstration site. We had no like funding to really get behind this. We, we weren't known. We were just two people who really believed in it. We weren't like a Will Harris or someone else who's very well known in the space. And so we, um, we did crowdfunding and we used it as a market indicator. And we said, if, if this is um, something that our region really supports and wants, then we'll be able to raise the funding to go through training and become a hub and become accredited professionals with the Savory Institute. And if our region doesn't see value in it, they won't support us. And then lo and behold, we, we were raised the money and were headed off on this journey. So hubs do it differently based on their context. What I'm seeing emerge is a lot of different people getting together. So you might have a farmer, you might have a nonprofit, maybe someone who works for a university, and all these people coming from their different resource bases coming together, and they decide and create this a hub. And I, I just got back from working with a group in Illinois that's doing that. Really inspiring to see everyone come together. And the more people, if it's the right people, that really, really have that same shared value, that deep passion to make this happen, if it's the right group. I think that it's so much better because you share the responsibility and you share the work. Anybody else want to want to add on to what Abby said there of how you guys got your hub funding started and were able to get your startup up and running? Ours is slightly different. We managed to source a grant uh, for two years that kind of got us up and running and we used that as our initial sort of seed funding. So instead of going to a bank to get a loan, we, um, we, we approached some grant agencies and they helped us get it going from the start. I think it's a lot easier now than what it was back then just because the Savory Network has grown. There are a lot more options to kind of ease your way into it. So that commitment doesn't have to be as intense as what it possibly was right in the beginning. But I think our way into that and around that was that we used a grant as startup capital. Spencer and I operate um, ranch in Northern California and we do contract raising and then we have our own herd of cattle. and. With our specific region, our specific context, our winters are, we have like real winters with snow and everything. And we do not like to feed hay like most of our neighbors do and have to, you know, go through the mud and muck and the animals are cold and all of that. And so we choose, and based on our context, to have a situation where the cattle come in and graze. So we raise the grass and we sell it and then the cattle come and eat that grass and then they go off to the next place. So in the winters, we don't have a lot of ranching to do, and that's by our choice. And so that's when most other ranchers in our region as well and farmers are not actively ranching. It's our dormant season. And so that's the perfect time to do courses and traveling. So pretty much November through March, Spencer is gone on the road around Northern California because it's so diverse and geographically and culturally as well. So we go to those different regions instead of 
having everyone come to us and to our area, then we travel to them and do courses and training and consulting. So it's a really great balance for us. It keeps us out of the winter blues and out exploring California. And when it's our growing season, we can be here on the ranch and together as a family and enjoying it. So it works for us. But I think there are a lot of different models as well. And not every hub has to be a farmer or a rancher. For example, our UK hub, they are not farmers or ranchers, but they partner with farmers and ranchers to provide demonstrations. Rolf, I'm curious if you have any follow-up to that in ways that hubs can synergize between other enterprises and what they're doing and then the goals of the hub. Yeah, Chris, for me, any enterprise that you're looking at doing, I think there has to be a synergy between what you're currently doing and becoming a hub. But then I think the decision, and in our case, what we do is we weigh up each unit, whether it's consulting, whether it's training, whether we putting up a deboning plant, it becomes part of that business and we have to allocate the resources accordingly and then based on those resources, we have to make sure that we have enough income. So I think it's really no different to any normal business and expanding a normal business if you're doing that. And then the other decision, is, and that's what we did, is we decided to start it from scratch as a separate entity based on staffing and resources and different things. So I think the decision really is, does it fit? And do you think that you can make it work within your context based on what you think your source of income is going to be? Yeah, perfect. Thank you guys both. So each hub must have an accredited professional that teaches savory courses, and that's part of our work at the Savory Institute and through the network to maintain the quality, the integrity, and the consistency of holistic management training throughout the world. So someone could come to our hub in California and take a course, and then they could go to Jorgen's hub in Sweden and take a course, and they would be of the same quality and you know, maybe in a different context, but it would be that core strength of holistic management and not some other alternative version. So every hub must, again, have an accredited professional. Now, to this question, there's two levels of accredited professionals. One we call a professional educator, and that means that you have the concepts, the principles, the philosophy of holistic management, as well as an understanding of the core processes that we use, like plant grazing and financial planning, land planning, and ecological monitoring. But you don't necessarily have to have the land and livestock management practical experience. So, for example, in our situation, Spencer does have that because he was formerly a ranch manager. So he's that second level, which is called a field professional, indicating that they have more field experience. And I, as someone who grew up on a ranch and works on a ranch but hasn't managed, I stay a professional educator. And to teach courses, you need to at least be a professional educator. Field professionals do a lot more of the consulting. So one farm or one hub only needs to have some type of accredited professional. I hope that addresses the question. Well, thank you guys again. Thank you first to our, our panelists for taking the time and to reiterate what Abby said. Could not be prouder to be uh, working with you all and so proud of the work that you guys are doing around the globe. So huge thank you. And thank you to Abby for all the work that she does as the network coordinator and to the audience. Thank you for joining. And if you'd like to follow up, that connection point is with Abby. Abby, you want to give the, the instructions on how to get to that form? Yeah, absolutely. If you go to Savory dot global slash network. That's our network page. And you scroll down to the hub section. There's a simple online form that we call our interest form. So if you have interest in exploring this more, you're thinking about it and feeling good about it and excited, I encourage you to just take the half an hour to fill out the form. And it will be a very good exercise for you and for us as well to see if this is the right fit. It's really very exploratory and doesn't commit you to anything, but it does allow you to really think through what it would be like and what it would take to be a hub in your region. And then I think we just continue that conversation and we want it to be right for everyone. So we've worked with ourselves and the Institute and with our network to really thrive as a network, to regenerate ourselves as well as the land so that we're not depleting ourselves as we're doing this really important work so that we can continue to do it. And I think it's really important to make sure that the way that you align with this work is a way that does give you enduring energy. And we want to help you do that. So don't feel pressure to do it, but to definitely take that next step and explore. So I'll send that to everyone, or you can go to savory.global slash network and check out the form. Well, thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. And uh, have a good rest of your day, wherever you are in the world.